What does Halevi appeal to as the essential core of Jewish belief? History. History, the Exodus. The Exodus, the revelation on Mount Sinai, which of course is the beginning of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, right? In other words, Halevi is, is basing it on the traditional notion of Jewish sacred history with revelation as its primary proof, right? Maimonides has divorced his basic belief in God from Jewish histor history. There's no mention of the Exodus here at the beginning of the, uh, of the Mishnah Torah. Here you see the big difference between Halevi's kind of religious conservatism and Maimonides' radical melding of Jew Judaism and philosophy. And I think that that's, that's something we have to understand, how radical he was. But Maimonides constantly ties in his ideas to the Torah. Yes. So that is, he is, he is purporting to have them as a basis in Revelation. Yes, he is. But notice, he starts with the premise, argued out rationally, and then he goes to the proof texts. Right? Yes. Okay? And so what he is doing is he's creating a philosophical midrash on the Bible, on the Hebrew Bible. By the way, that goes back to Philo. <laughs> okay, he never written, did, never heard of Philo, but Philo is basically doing the same thing, you know, uh, a thousand years before Maimonides. More than a thousand years before Maimonides. Yeah. I always feel very troubled by arguments like that. That... You mean Halevi's? Not Halevi's in particular, but others like it. Yes. It seems to me, and even Maimonides himself, forgive me for <laughs> standing up. Stay what you want. <laughs> but it seems to me that these people are proving, are using as proof the very thing that they are attempting to prove. You might say <coughs> that. Um, don't forget, for them, even for Maimonides, the Bible is the source of ultimate truth. But it all depends on how you interpret it. So he is reading the Bible through the philosophical lens. Right? So for him, that is the true meaning of the Bible. I understand, I think. However, if God is by definition outside of the, the rational and natural world. No, well, it's not rational. God is outside of the natural world, but God is the prime mover and the essence of everything. Okay? It's not that belief in God is non-rational. Belief in God, according to my mind, is the most rational. That there is a unifying principle at the heart of all existence. And that is God. I see. So yes, it's a Brian. question, excuse me, it's a question of vocabulary. No, it's a question of um, some people view belief as a leap beyond reason. For Maimonides, mm -hmm. belief in God is the result of reason. There is nothing non that is non-rational about it. It is the most rational deductions that you can come to if you think correctly in the right way. He says if you don't come to that, you're not thinking about it in the right way. Yeah, but he's, he's asserting, for example... God does not have physical existence. Yes, and he's arguing why that makes logical sense. Right. But if God is God, he is, she is not constrained by the limitations of rationality. Um, he would disagree with you. He would have to say that God is reason. God, can, Nothing about God cannot be without reason. It may be that we, don't, we cannot fully understand God because we are humans and we are not God, and we'll see that, that God's wisdom is different than our concept of wisdom, but nothing that God is or does can be outside the idea of reason and science. It is impossible for God to be non-rational. Yes, Brian? But in fact, he's done something not only radical, but with very threatening Portents, and that is he's shifted the foundation of belief from sacred history, sacred text, and revelation to the workings of the human mind and human apprehension. Yes. And, and he puts in, and by that virtue, rationalism 
become supplanted by empiricism, and empiricism apparently leads to a inability to perceive God. Well, my, it was one of the parts of Maimonides that was criticized by traditionalists, and when it came around to the guide, it's one of the reasons why the guide was banned by some authorities, why the study of philosophy was banned by some authorities. Um, and in fact, one of the reasons why he wrote the guide for his student was, and he knew it wasn't just for him, was the notion that those who had studied philosophy and those who had studied Judaism couldn't, could see the conflict between the two. And he was trying to resolve those conflicts. Um, and, you know, he is completely consistent throughout his entire career. I mean, he does make some changes and so on and so forth, but he, his, his, his um, agenda is, it, from the time he was young, is stays the same. That's one of his remarkable ideas. Things. But he really is, I mean, we, we see him as one of the great sages and the foundation of Judaism, but Judaism and Christianity alike, both from this period on to the 17th century, made, it wasn't, they weren't really standing fast and beating the lectern and pointing to the sacred texts. They were making all of these compromises with philosophical Well, it depends thinking. on which, where in the community you're talking about. One of the things you have to understand is by the end of the Middle Ages, the study of philosophy in the Jewish community vir virtually disappeared. Okay, and Kabbalah became the major expression of Jewish spirituality, right? Philosophy really only get, I mean, people are still reading Maimonides, but philosophy only really revives itself in the 18th and 19th century amongst Jewish thinkers. Yes, Cantor? There may be too wide of a question, but Spinoza, is that... That Spinoza is the guy who ended the connection between the Bible and philosophy. But wasn't kind of taking from Maimonides? I mean, he read Maimonides, but he didn't like Maimonides. In other words, he criticizes Maimonides in many ways, because he says you don't need the Bible. It doesn't necessarily lead to Jewish belief, right? The Jewish I, belief? Or any form of re or, or religious doctrine. Here you go, his communication. Well, what ultimately happens is, is that Spinoza doesn't see the Bible as divine revelation because for him God is a is being is a, at the at the heart of existence. He be, he he is a he is a pantheist and a deist. He doesn't believe in a God that re, that brings revelation for him. The the law of the Torah is human made and it is a human law, right? So if Philo was the first philosopher to connect the Bible and philosophy to blend it together. Spin this is, of course, the theory of the late scholar, Harvard scholar Harry Wolfson. Spinoza is the first modern philosopher to tear it apart. Okay? Yes, Sam? Which of the three proofs uh, is, uh, does Judah Halevi's idea follow? It's not <laughs> cosmological. He doesn't argue these. He's arguing from, he's not arguing from philosophical proofs. He's arguing from Jewish tradition, the traditional notion that the Exodus and the revelation of Sinai is at what the heart of Jewish belief. So you wouldn't call it theological? No, 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 no. We'll get, we'll get to the, okay. he, does, he doesn't, I, I tell you the truth, I haven't read the Kuzari deeply enough to know whether he talks about some of these arguments. I'm sure he does, mm -hmm. but for him the cardinal notion is the idea of Jewish uh, history and revelation. Mm -hmm. But he, does, he doesn't base first principles on the cosmological argument. Okay, so let's, um, so then he goes to the notion that God, you know, he doesn't, God has, doesn't have a physical body. In number 10, which is not here, but what I gave you is he deals with the issue of why did Moses say, show me your glory? In other words, he, he gives a, a kind of, uh, a, a, um, he reinterprets this idea allegorically, which is typical for philosophers to take bib anthropomorphic biblical texts and to see them as allegories and metaphors. Um, and then uh, in number 9, he, of course, is doing a whole bunch of that stuff. And so he talks about issues of when it talks about God's feet or God's fingers or God's eyes or God's hands or God's ears. And notice in the middle of num number nine, which is in our text on page 44, the Torah speaks in the language of men. This is a, this is a rabbinic saying, right? Which um, Maimonides said means that human language requires metaphors and allegories to talk of things which you cannot actually comprehend in normal uh, perception and language, right? He says, has God done a sword and does he slay with the sword? The term is used allegorically, and all these phrases are to be understood in a similar sense. And then he quotes a biblical text which, you know, suggests 
um, that, you know, he talks about Daniel sees God as white as snow. Um, he sees Moses saw him as a mighty man waging war, and so on and so forth. And on Sinai, and here he's quoting a rabbinic midrash, that, he's, that God is wrapped in a talit, right? All indicates that in reality he has no form of figure. In other words, because there are all these multiple metaphors for God, God can't be every one of those things at once. Therefore, they must, you know, God isn't one of them in particular or, any, or all of them at once. So therefore, these are allegorical. He says, this is a critical line, but God's essence as it really is, the human mind does not understand and is incapable of grasping or investigating. So that's why we use metaphors. By the way, that's a very modern idea, right? That all language about God is metaphorical, right? When you look at modern Jewish philosophy or uh, issues regarding gender uh, discussion of God in prayer, everybody understands that lang you cannot capture God in language. To do so is to make that image of God an idol. Um, and nonetheless, it doesn't mean that metaphors are mere fictions. They <coughs> reveal some truth, but only part of the truth. As one um, scholar, um, not a Jewish scholar, puts it, um, we take metaphors literally, not literally, but seriously. Right? We take them seriously, but not literally. And I think that's, Maimonides would come to a similar position. Do you have a question? Okay, so um, that's, that's what he does in, in number 9 and number 10. Um, in number 11, he talks a little bit more about um, the notion that if God doesn't have a body, then none of the functions of the body are appropriate to him, neither measure nor place, ascent or descent, right or left, back, front, standing, sitting. And then he says, uh, he is not found within time so that he would possess a beginning, an end, or an age. He doesn't change, for there is nothing that can cause him to change. The concept of death is not applicable to him, nor is that of life within the context of physical life. The concept of foolishness, nor the concept of wisdom, in terms of human wisdom. Neither sleep nor waking, neither anger or laughter, neither joy nor sadness, silence nor speech, and the human understanding of speech are appropriate terms of which to describe him. What does he mean, therefore? What is, there is no anything about God that is likened to human character, despite the fact the Bible is filled with representations of God getting angry, um, you know, being upset, being happy, you know. He says this is all allegory and metaphor. And yet we are presumably in God's image. He gets to that later on. He understands that allegorically. In fact, what he does is he connects up human consciousness and sentience as being godlike. That is the thing that divides us from the animals. Animals don't have consciousness the way we do. Wrong. Or reason. Reason. Okay? Um, okay, so that's chapter one. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to have to leave a little early today at quarter two, but let's begin chapter two. And what we're going to do next week is carry on with this because this is, to me, this is the heart of. Uh, what we have to understand about Maimonides, um, and then we'll look at other sections as well. So, let's begin with chapter 2. Um, now, chapter 2 is about the love and the fear of God. Two commandments found in Deuteronomy. And what he says here is, what he means is, the scientific, the scientific study of creation leads us to see God's wisdom in the world. In other words, through the study of the natural world, we begin to see the activity of God. We don't see God, we see the activity of God. And so, and, and then he points out, he sees the love of God as a kind of spiritual longing and what Kramer calls an erotic dialogue between God and the human soul. He touches on this in this chapter but goes into it a lot deeper uh, in the laws of repentance, which we will look at. Um, and um, one of the critical points, as you will see, is, is that God's knowledge is not separate from God. Meaning, we acquire knowledge. It is something that is separate from us. But God's knowledge is part of God, or, or is God, so to speak. Not part of God, is God. And this will have implications for the notion of divine providence and free will, as we will see. 
Okay, but let's take a look at the chapter. This is one of my favorite passages from uh, Maimonides. So whose turn is it? Um, uh, sure, it's Brian's turn. Brian gets our, a turn. Our huh? filmmaker. Please, this chapter God, one. Go ahead, yes. This God, honored and revered, it is our duty to love and fear, as it is said, you shall love the Lord your God. And it is further said, you shall fear the Lord your God. Okay, so first he's stating the commandments. Now he's going to interpret what they mean. Go on. And what is the way that will lead to the love of him and the fear of him? When a person contemplates his great and wondrous works and creatures, and from them obtains a glimpse of his wisdom, which is incomparable and infinite, he will straightway love him, praise him, glorify him, and long with an exceeding longing to know his great name. Even as David said, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And when he ponders these matters, he will recoil frightened and realize that he is a small creature, lowly and obscure, endowed with slight and slender intelligence, standing in the presence of him who is perfect in knowledge. And so David said, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, what is man that you are mindful of him? In harmony with these sentiments, I shall explain some large general aspects of the works of the sovereign of the universe, that they may serve the intelligent individual as a door to the love of God, even as our sages have remarked in connection with the theme of the love of God, observe the universe, and hence you will realize him who spoke and the world was. Okay, so notice what he does. The love of God is to be fulfilled, and he means here the scientific study of the natural world. And from the scientific study of the natural world, you will feel this sense of wonder and love at the wisdom of God because you will see the order, the intricacy, the beauty of it, and you will therefore love the Lord <coughs> your God. And he uses a phrase from, uh, from Psalms that my soul thirsts for God. This is this erotic dialogue, so to speak. So first of all is this drawing near through this incredible study of the natural world. Okay, But then it also makes you realize how small you are in the greatness of creation, how low you are. It, it brings out humility. If one is joy and wonder, here it is awe, because that's the way we have to understand fear. All right, Not fear in the normal sense of the word, but awe and humility. And there he quotes Psalm 8, the beginning of Psalm 8, uh, interesting, or, or the, the part where the psalmist is being humble. Um, when I consider your elevens the work of your, what is man that you are mindful of him? So, having told you that this is what brings about the love and the awe of God, which are two, having established the existence of God, the nature of God as far as we know it, now he's going to explain how you understand the wisdom of God through scientific study. And he tells you, I shall explain some large general aspects of the works of the sovereign of the universe. He's now going to give you a basic cosmology and science. So your average literate reader doesn't have to go deep into astronomical or, or, or works of physics. He's giving everybody a basic education in science in what follows. Sort of the reader's digest of his day. Uh, I would say more intelligent than that. Now, if you take a look at the ones that are missed here on page two of the extra material, um, he talks about how, first of all, there are three categories of creation. He begins with the three categories of creation. Creature, creations with our a combination of matter and form. This is the sublunar world, right? Creations which are a combination of matter and form, but do not, and, and of course the number A changes. Number B, creations which are a creation of matter and form, but do not change. And these are some of the, these are some of the spheres, right? The planets. And then three, creations which have form but no matter of all, which are the angels. Now, here is where, in this part, Maimonides is employing what is called the teleological argument for the existence of God, or the, what is modernly called the argument from design. But notice he is not doing it to prove the existence of God, 
but rather he is using it to argue for the evolution of what you might call the proper spirituality. And if you want to see the earliest Jewish, um, uh, aside from in the Bible itself, the earliest Jewish philosophical promulgation of this idea, if you look at page two of the material I gave you today, here is from Philo of Alexandria. He is the first Western philosopher to employ the teleological argument for the existence of God. He does it in more than one place, but this is in his work called Allegorical Interpretations. And although later he does quote the notion of revelation, okay, he begins with this. And what does it say? His, his allegory is a man who sees a house, carefully built, provided with all the things. He would never suppose the house had been completed without skill and without a builder. And then he points out any ship, any city, right? And therefore, seeing the heavens revolving in a circle and comprehending everything within it, and all the planets and fixed stars moving onwards in the same manner and on the same principles in regular order, and in due harmony in such a manner as most advantageous for the whole created universe, and the earth stationed in the central effusion, and so on and so forth, um, all of these things were not made without skill, but that God was and is the creator of this whole universe. They then who draw their conclusions to this matter perceive God in his shadow arriving at a due comprehension of the artist through his works. And in another time he uses the metaphor of seeing a statue, <coughs> of a beautiful statue of a person. And you would not suppose that that statue would come into existence spontaneously. It's what uh, Paley in the 18th century, Bishop Paley said, if you came on a, uh, upon a watch on a beach, you would assume that the parts of the watch had not come together uh, you know, by themselves, but there was a watchmaker. And of course, one of the big things about modern biologists like Richard Dawkins and uh, the late Stephen Jay Gould is to say, no, you cannot infer from the physical world, the nature of the physical world, a design and a designer. And of course, those who are the intelligent design people and the creationists, that's what they're trying to do. They are trying to take this argument and say, it's not just a religious idea, but it's a scientific idea, okay? And that's where all the big arguments are going on uh, uh, be, you know, in certain states about the teaching of intelligent design. Uh, most legitimate biologists want to separate theology from their science, whatever they personally believe. They, can, they do not want to employ this in any of their scientific thinking. That does not mean that the teleological argument is, is, is without use. But theologians who are knowledgeable about science take it up to a much different level, who see the, not the design of individual parts or creatures, but rather the overall process of order out of chaos that emerges in this universe, as well as um, the notion of evolution producing consciousness and conscious observers as being a divine process. But that's a whole other issue, um, and we're going to have to stop today. As I said, I've got to stop a little early. Okay? Yes, please.